There's a standing rule when it comes to licensed or tie-in comics, and that is, they tend to suck. However, what happens when a bad or mediocre movie gets the same treatment? Can tie-in comics clear that bar and actually be better than their source material? Well, in most cases, no. They're either direct adaptations, which can be roughly on par with the original, or they're just quick cash grabs designed to solely cash in on the success of a given project. But with the right creative team and a little bit of luck, the right comic can not only be perfectly adequate, but excel to even higher in the source material itself. So let's take a look at them as I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 comic book tie-ins that redeemed bad movies. Number 10. Iron Man 2 – Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, it is blasphemous now to mention the rocky start the Marvel Cinematic Universe got off to, but it is true. For the longest time, Iron Man 2 was considered a legitimately bad film. Even today, it's either regarded as a necessary evil or an underappreciated masterpiece, just like everything else in the MCU. Regardless, a weak point of the film was the prominent role put on S.H.I.E.L.D. without any development being given to those agents. This three-story anthology tie-in focuses on the very heart of Tony Stark's relationship with S.H.I.E.L.D. As he watches them, while Nick Fury assigns an agent to watch him. Then there's some Phil Coulson fun. The final story is about Black Widow infiltrating Stark Industries and ends when the film finally introduces her as Natalie Rushman. Number 9. Alien Nation Alien Nation gained a small cult status throughout the years with a television show and made-for-TV movies, but it was critically reviled upon release. The neo-noir cop film paired a veteran detective with the first newcomer detective as they solve a homicide. Newcomers were the name given to the 3,000 aliens that landed in the Mojave Desert to escape their slavery on their planet and began integrating with humans in contemporary Los Angeles. DC Comics did a comic adaptation of the film, which was good, but the real crown jewel comes from Malibu Comics' run with the franchise. While not directly related to the movies, they expand on the setting and the premise, continuing the themes and ideas of the show. Be it in the alien nation The Spartans, with a member of the Newcomer Advocacy League being asked by a newcomer to help find his missing brother, or a breed apart that starts with a new cop pairing checking out a home invasion that leads to gangland violence. The comics retroactively expand on the universe, adding a level of understanding to the film that was actually sorely missing. Number 8. Darth Vader, Dark Lord of the Sith a mindless mix of action, bland writing, and unsatisfying leaps in canon that feigned a character study of Anakin Skywalker and his fall to the dark side, the prequels have only gotten more infamous with age. If anything were to redeem them, however, even just a little bit, then it would be Darth Vader, Dark Lord of the Sith. The book picks up moments after the no heard round the world at the end of Revenge of the Sith, and depicts Vader's rise to becoming the menacing villain of the original trilogy. The series as a whole allows for Anakin to begin in shedding his Jedi ways and taking the painful journey into becoming a Sith Lord. One plot that exemplifies this is his need to create a red lightsaber, which means killing a Jedi and taking his to ruin it with the dark side of the Force. The character development is deep and it uses the prequels as a foundation to build from. It may not outright redeem the prequels from being bad films, but more than allows for them to feel like necessary steps to get the villain that we see in the original trilogy. Number 7. Ghostbusters Answer the Call the Ghostbusters franchise has had a wondrous life in comic books. IDW Publishing obtained the rights in 2008 and began making one-shots and miniseries that became home runs, galvanizing a new wave of interest in the Ghostbusters brand. This continued popularity led to a film that even its defenders admit isn't all that great. Ghostbusters 2016 was just alright, it had moments of greatness, but it was hindered by the legacy of the previous two installments. However, Ghostbusters Answer the Call makes this alright movie true truly shine. Kelly Thompson writes fully formed characters as the gals of the new film take on a powerful new entity, who feeds on fear and wants to turn the world into a nightmare dimension. With a story that focuses on the fears, dreams, and pasts of these characters, they finally come into their own. It's strong, yet entertaining. This is the team that needed to be in the movie for a franchise to grow, but it unfortunately was not what we got. Number 6. Push no one may actually remember the movie Push. Chris Evans and Dakota Fanning starred in this 2009 unique take on the superhero genre, tying all the powers into physical abilities. Critics tore this film apart for its lackluster story, and audiences gave it a half-hearted shrug for its mindless action. The problem with the film was that it wanted to be a franchise so the world wasn't fleshed out enough to sink their teeth into. But this is where the prequel comics come in to save the day. The six-issue prequel series came out during the build-up to the film's release, and it 
it was the story that Push needed to actually be. It had a central story about Agent Ezra Lowe and his colleagues at The Division, the psychic policing agency, as a mission goes wrong. It doesn't just dump exposition as the film does, but it rather tells the audience by showing the world. It's almost necessary reading to be able to enjoy the film on anything more than just being a random action set piece. Number 5. Jennifer's Body now, 2009 was not a good year for movies. Jennifer's Body was billed as a dark comedy, but it was neither funny nor dark. It did not make its budget back or gain anything but mixed reviews on release, and the reason for that came down to the main reason that most horror and comedies fail, and that is that nobody cared about the characters. The Boom Studio adaptation written by Rick Spears corrected that by cutting Jennifer out of the majority of it. Rather than focusing on the slasher film aspects of Jennifer killing everyone, it focuses on the men she's killing, giving them more time in the spotlight shows us why we want to see them die. The revenge of the demonically possessed Megan Fox has more meaning when she's not just killing stock jocks, but is instead murdering some truly despicable people. As a companion piece, both work together to create one good story that is worthy of being the cult classic it's recently being claimed to be. Number 4. Beyond the Black Hole the Black Hole is one of the few forgotten Disney movies. Coming out in 1979, this science fiction film was about the spaceship, the Palomino, finding a lost ship, the Cygnus, on the event horizon of a black hole. Once on board, the sole occupant, Dr. Reinhardt, and his robotic crew are hospitable, but there's an uneasiness about the whole thing. Then we get the disaster movie section where a meteor storm knocks out the null gravity field, keeping the Cygnus near the black hole, and only a handful escape into the black hole, which after a trippy 1 or 2001 B scene, they emerge from a white hole. What worked against this film, besides coming out at the same time as the first Star Trek movie and having to follow Star Wars two years prior, was its pacing. The plot could have worked well if the script was not focused on explaining everything in monotone exposition dumps, but where expository dialogue failed on the big screen, it proved to be a success in the comic. By taking two of the six issues to adapt the film, the flaws were hammered out and the rest of the series acted as a sequel without having the problems that came with Disney during the 1970s. 70s. Number 3. The Fountain Darren Aronofsky is well known for his love of psychological subject matter, with a few exceptions of course, but this was a far more ambitious endeavour that didn't hit home with critics or audiences. Aronofsky held the rights to a graphic novel, and it was Vertigo Comics who got to publish it. He allowed for artist Kent Williams to interpret the script in his own unique and breathtaking way, but the plot remained primarily the same. The transition to comics allowed for a much more focused and less convoluted storyline. The graphic novel is a must-have, and after reading it, the film becomes so much much better. Number 2. Southland Tales – The Prequel Saga so Southland Tales was booed out of cans. It was beat down by critics and buried by audiences. Now, granted, a decade after its 2006 release, there have been defenders popping up to reappraise the project, with the film having potentially taken on a new kind of relevance in today's zeitgeist. But the point of Southland Tales was that it was meant to be this sprawling media franchise, not just a movie. But the comics and whatever else was planned for it were all meant to tell a singular narrative. The three prequel graphic novels do explain and expand the story of the movie, as well as the characters that we are meant to have some inkling of a connection with and thus is essential reading if you want to enjoy this film, which is very questionably enjoyable in the first place. And number one, Star Trek Countdown. The 2009 Star Trek film was a shock to old school fans of Trek, a more action-oriented affair. In line with director J.J. Abrams' future outing for the Star Wars franchise, it was a massive hit with critics and audiences alike. It rewrote the timeline of all known Star Trek canon by simply starting out on a time travel story, and focused on these characters based off of the for want of a nail cascade effect. The comic is a prequel to that story, building on the weakest part of the film, which is actually the villain, Nero. Star Trek Countdown is not a prequel to the 2009 movie in a conventional sense, but rather acts as a prologue to the full story that creates the Kelvin timeline. The downfall of Nero is tragic and heartbreaking because he was the idealist, agreeing with the Federation and trying to get his fellow Romulans to listen to him about the upcoming celestial disaster. That failure to his people and some other massive problems shift him to the antagonist role and builds him to being on par with Khan. Seriously, this comic is that good. It's the build-up and the history that makes this the redeeming factor that was the massive failure 
feeling of the Star Trek 2009 project. There's also a large amount of extended cameos from the Star Trek The Next Generation crew, and we learn that parts of the time-traveling ship are Borg tech, adding a further depth to one of the film's most underdeveloped elements. And there we go, my friends. Those were 10 comic book tie-ins that redeemed bad movies. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comment section below. You can go follow me over on Twitter at RetroJ with a zero, or you can swing by Live and Let's Dice, where I do all of my streaming outside of work, and I'd love to see you over there. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.